I'm going to ask you a very blunt question this afternoon. Which one of your private parts is most likely to send you to hell? So if you weren't awake before Mass, you certainly are now, right? So I'm going to answer that for you. The private part that is most likely to send you to hell is your heart. If your heart is in the right place, every part of your body and every aspect of your soul is going to do what it is designed by God to do. And if your heart isn't in the right place, then I'll tell you right now, everything you do with your body and your soul, all of it, is going to tend toward unnatural vice. It's all going to be against the very nature God designed you with. And it's going to be a sin against the supernatural grace of love that the Lord poured into your heart in abundance at your baptism. When three little shepherd children at Fatima in Portugal were given a terrifying vision of hell, Jacinta Martos asked the Blessed Mother, what is the sin that sends most people to hell? And Our Lady told her, sins against chastity. My friends, this was in 1917. The internet hadn't even been invented yet. Now, many moral theologians will argue that sins against the Sixth and Ninth Commandments are not necessarily the worst ones in the grand scheme of things, but they often can be incredibly destructive beyond the intentions of anyone who commits them. We live in a particularly immodest age And by that, I don't just mean some skimpy clothing here and there on billboards, right? I mean, there are many people for whom the only taboo you cannot talk about and even engage intelligently is the Catholic Church's teaching on sex, marriage, and family life. It's almost totally rejected outside of the church. It's under attack like never in its history before, inside the church. From nuns all the way to cardinals. Even for those of us who want to believe what the Lord Jesus means by the sixth and ninth commandments revealed on Mount Sinai, it's easy for us to find everything and everyone around us. It seems like they're conspiring to make us think that our true freedom is in the liberation of every part of our body except for the heart. And the more the children of this world throw off what they see is the chains of outdated attitudes toward the flesh. We see more suicide, more depression, more failed relationships, more of everything except for happy hearts, happy families, and happy societies. Now, of course, if you think I'm going to stand here and preach a diatribe against all of the various sins committed by everyone else in this area, not going to do it. Why? Because the best way to root out a vice from our lives is not to wallow in our failings of the past, but to develop the opposing virtue in patience, humility, and meekness. You know, I've been a priest for long enough to let you in on a secret. You know, whenever I see somebody ranting and raving about somebody else's sins, I stand back and say, "Mm, you better watch out. I'm reminded of those terrifying words of Jesus to Peter. 
Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, confirm your brothers. Remember that the Lord says this in predicting that Peter will betray him. It is a reminder that every single one of us, without exception, can be sifted like wheat by the prince of darkness at any time. And we should have the humility and compassion to admit only by the grace of God go I. The virtue of chastity is mocked today. It's some kind of medieval puritanical neurosis. Oh, those poor Catholics, they just suck all the fun out of life, right? And even believing Christians have this tendency sometimes to reduce it to the mere state of not doing X, Y, and Z with A, B, and C. Whether those letters represent people, places, things, or time. We abuse the virtue of modesty by pretending that our bodies and even our natural desires are bad. When in fact, modesty reminds us that which is sacred is veiled. Not because it's bad, but because it is set apart by our loving God for something wonderful and amazing. Think about when you come into church. How many things do you see that are veiled in the church? Right? The tabernacle, the chalice, the altar. Many of our women choose to veil. Why? Because they're vessels of life. Is it because any of these things are filthy? Oh, no, no. On the contrary. They are precious to God. That is why our bodies are veiled appropriately, because they are temples of the Holy Spirit. They are places of worship of the living and true God. As St. John Paul II once said of pornography, pornography is not wrong because of what it shows of the human person. It is wrong because of what it doesn't show. Namely, the dignity of the body as designed by our wise God. Chastity has less to do with what we do with our bits than what we do with our hearts. If our heart is undivided, unfettered, unashamed, then it will order our bodies and souls, our relationships, and our homes. St. Francis de Sales, whose introduction to the devout life is accompanying us through this first part of 2020, reminds us that chastity is the lily of the virtues and makes men almost equal to the angels. And everyone greatly needs this virtue. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. If we want to go to heaven, if we want to see God face to face, then you know what? We're not going to get there if our heart is divided, fractured by what sin causes in us. And to do that, we can't keep our hearts where they need to be and play with fire at the same time. St. Francis de Sales, in his winsome way, writes, A little butterfly sees the flame and hovers curiously about it, trying to find out if it is as fine as it looks. And carried away by this fancy, it doesn't stop until it's destroyed at the very first test. People become so enthralled by false and foolish ideas as to the pleasure found in these voluptuous flames, that after many alluring thoughts, they at last plunge into ruin and perish. What is the most sad part of sins against purity? 
It's not the pleasure. It's not the bodies. It's not even the feelings. It's the fact that we deceive ourselves in accepting an unreal situation. And whenever we accept the unreal in place of the real, it's going to hit us hard. If you have ever had a relationship destroyed, or if you yourself have destroyed it, you know exactly how this happens. You daydream up this make-believe world. And when you wake up from it, you think there are going to be roses falling from the sky at your feet. And instead, there's just ruin and destruction all around you. I could stand before you today and share with you any number of statistics on how what the church identifies as sins against chastity are having an incredibly catastrophic effect on all of us. You know, I am the last person to be engaging in fear-mongering, but when you read some of these things, you're like, sweet Jesus, where are we going? But you know what? Knowing all those gory details isn't going to help us develop the virtues that give us true freedom and build us up as men and women, as families, churches, and societies. St. Philip Neri once commented, In the battle for chastity, it is the coward who wins. I remember when I first read that, I was like, surely I read that wrong. That can't be right. Why would he want us to be a coward? That doesn't make any sense. What he means by that is that we need to know ourselves enough to know what affects us and how. Different people are triggered by different things. With most vices, we have to squarely face head-on what is causing us to sin. But with impurity, it is the opposite. We simply must do everything in our power to avoid the near occasion of sin. To surround ourselves with healthy and positive people. healthy and positive places, healthy and positive things, and have frequent recourse to confession and Holy Communion. Not in an automatic kind of way, but truly entering into those mysteries and celebrating them with proper preparation, disposition, and thanksgiving. And when we've come across others who are struggling with sins against chastity, Don't get on your high horse because someone else sins differently than you do because I guarantee God will humble you real quick. Like I said last week, keep calm and carry on. Don't let the past compromise your future. Every saint has a past And every sinner has a future, as St. Augustine once wrote. If you are struggling in this area, and if the statistics are valid, we're all in this together, my friends. Don't fool yourselves. Then don't despair. 